Tonight's scripture reading will be from Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 to 16. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of dead, not as to though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, lest us mind the same thing. Well, we're glad you came back tonight. Some of you weren't here this morning and you're with us tonight. We just want to welcome you and We've been going through the book of Philippians, and, and I'm going to do something different tonight. I'm, I'm not going to preach on Philippians. I just want to draw a thought from there and go to another portion of Scripture. And there won't be any outline up here tonight. All right? I just had too busy a week, and Friday afternoon I just said to Elaine, forget it. I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, I'll preach on Sunday, and they'll have to do the old-fashioned thing and just pay attention. Right, instead of read it off the wall. So uh, that's what we're going to try and do tonight. One of my favorite verses in the Bible has always been Philippians 3.10. That, that Paul just says, I narrowed down my life to this thing, this, this sort of this one thing in my life, and it is that I could know him. If I couldn't do anything else, Paul says, that's what I want to do, and and, and this one thing of knowing Christ, when you stop to think about it, what better thing could you do with your life? Just to know Him. And then down in verse 14, or, well, let's look at verse 12 for a second. Not that I have already attained. How many of you think you've already attained? You know, you've reached that level, you're, you're just about as perfect as you could be. None of us here would say that. And so we need to realize, okay, I haven't attained, and if I haven't attained, then I, I need to be working on this, right? There's some steps I need to take. Verse 14 says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing on towards that goal, and I just want to challenge you tonight to ask yourself honestly, can I really say I'm pressing towards the goal? Or are you just kind of sliding by with what you can get away with? You know, you come, you sing, it feels pretty good to be together with God's people, and then we go back to our lives and we sort of forget them. Or are we really pressing towards the goal that God has for me and for you in our lives? Verse 15 says, Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. If, if you aren't mature in certain areas... How many of you could say, I can think of an area where I'm not really fully mature? There's some areas that I still need to work on in my life. Usually there's at least one main one that God will highlight for you. And, and I like what it says there. He will reveal even this to you. And that's where I want to challenge you tonight to keep your heart and your mind open to that thing in your life. It may be more than one, but there's one thing. Now, in this next year, this is a New Year's message, all right? That's why it's going to be a little different. And I know we had one uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I heard some people, though, saying this morning, Happy New Year, all right? So I don't know how long you go on wishing Happy New Year, but Happy New Year, everybody. But this is a, a New Year's challenge that I want to lay before you, and in the, in the other message, we looked at Moses' life, and we talked about four choices, right? I want to try and narrow it down in some ways for you tonight so that you walk out of here with one thing on your mind. I'm just going to ask you and challenge you to pick one thing in your life that this year, 
will change and be different. There's a lot of things you could do in this next year, aren't there? And you know what? There'll be a lot of things you will do. Some significant and some insignificant. But you'll do a lot of things. And, and I want to talk about the one thing that I believe with all my heart you've got to do. And I'll even go so far as to say, you know what? For me, it may be one thing, and for you, it might be something that's a bit, bit different. There may be some other area that God wants to highlight and reveal to you in your life that this is where you need to go to work. This is where you need to, to get involved in this particular thing in your life. For some of you, depending on what's going on in your life, it might be your relationships. It might be a relationship that, that you need to work to restore. It might be a relationship that you need to bring an end to and say, this is not working, this is not good. Some of you, it might be, I need to work on my marriage this year. It's going in a direction that's not good. And if I look a year from now and then five years from now, it's not going to be healthy. And that might be the one thing that you need to pick, that you need to begin to work on and begin to build. For some of you, it might be your finances, right? They're in a mess, to be honest, and they're not, it's not God-honoring, and that you need to determine that this year you're going you're gonna to crack the whip on yourself, and you're going to put things in order, and there's some things you're going to be prepared to do without, and you might have to sell your car and get a cheaper one, and you don't care what anybody else says about it. You're going to change this thing that will make a significant difference in your life so that a year from now, you can look back and say, you know what, God did something in my life this year. If I were to challenge you tonight, just take a microphone and come back where you are and walk up and put the mic in front of you and say, what's evident that God has done, that God has changed in your life in 2014? Could you speak up and say, it's this. This is the thing that God put on my heart all year long, and I just worked at this and worked at this and worked at this, and... and Significant changes, I've made strides forward, I'm pressing towards the what? The mark. God has accomplished something in my life in this last year. If you can't, you at least ought to be frustrated about that, <laughs> at the very least, right? That God, I believe that when we're saved and trusted Christ our Savior, that He goes to work. And he says he's not going to stop until you've reached perfection, and you've all admitted none of you are there yet. So there's got to be some things that God's working on in your life. Some things that maybe some of you already say, Pastor, you could just end this message because I already know what it is. Well, I'm not going to quit because there's some others who haven't figured it out yet. But, but I want you to think about that thing that if you go to work on, in the power of God and with the aid of the Spirit of God, in light of the Word of God, that that a year from now, your life could be significantly different and significantly better and significantly more God-honoring. Wouldn't you want to find out what that thing was and wouldn't you want to do it? Now, I know what we'd all like to do. I'd like to know what that thing is and know how to walk over here and push this button and instantly it's done. Because I don't want to take a year to work on it. But how many of you figured out God doesn't work that way most of the time? Every once in a while, he just instantly delivers from this thing or that thing. But most of the time, it's just get in there, get in the Word, let God work in your heart, let the Spirit of God get control of your life and begin to change you in this area of your life. I don't know what that thing is for you. I know what it is for me this year. And you don't even have to tell me what it is for you, but you need to figure it out for your sake, the thing that God wants to change. It may be, be something that you've already thought about. It, it may be something that somebody that loves you enough has already taken the courage and spoken to you and said, you know what, this is the area you, you need to change in your life. This is the thing that you need to be yielding over to God and letting him give you the victory in this area of your life so that your life can be significantly different a year from now. You may even have made a resolution about this 
last year or the year before or the year before, but somewhere along the way in this last year, you lost track. You lost your focus. And you didn't zero in on it, and you didn't work at it the way that you know that you should have, and you ended up the year in the exact same place or maybe worse off than you were at the beginning of the year. I don't want that to happen to you again. I want you to be able to make some steps forward and strides forward where you see God work and bring changes to your life, where you recognize that there's this goal that I need to accomplish. There's, there's this change of direction. There's this project that I need to complete. There's this area where I need to get involved. It may be in your church. It may be in your community. I don't know. I'm prepared to leave that in God's hands, to allow him to work on your heart and to make the changes so that things will be different. God may lay on your heart this evening somebody that you need to go home in the next week and get on the phone and dial their number and have a talk with them and say, you know what, I blew it. And we've been out of fellowship for a while and we need to restore that fellowship. We need to bring this relationship back together. There are things in your life that you feel terrible about, you feel guilty about. Anybody got some of those? I, I could mention a few, right, in my own life. But then we, we walk around and we don't do anything about it. We think we ought to, that one of these days we're going to, but we don't. I want to challenge you to just realize that there's some of these areas of your life and it's kind of hanging over you and there's this thing that's a part of your life and you don't even really like it anymore. Matter of fact, it's become a burden, but you aren't prepared to walk away from it to make some decisions about that in your life. There's something, I'll guarantee you, there's something you need to do because God didn't leave you here to do nothing, right? There's something, something special that God wants you to take 2015, and if you don't get anything else done, you're determined, I'm going to get this done in my life. And I, I want to go back into the Old Testament, the book of Nehemiah. Some of you can begin to look for that. Some of you have to go to the front of your Bible and find out where that is. But, but in, in my Bible, it's on page 624. All right, I can't help you any more than that. But, but find the book of Nehemiah. i just give you a second to find that, the book of Nehemiah. And I'm going to lead us. I'm not going to jump right to it, but I want to lead us to a verse that a number of years ago I studied through the book of Nehemiah. And, and I'll kind of do it in, a, in, in one message tonight, but I took about 20 weeks a number of years ago and sort of walked through this book. And there was a verse that really got a hold of my heart and and made a difference in my life after studying through it and it impacted me. It's a verse that impacted and changed the way that, that I looked at parenting and, and my children and, and, and the way that I manage money. It's a verse that challenged me with a, a hobby of mine, I guess I'll put it in that term, so that, that, and, and, and that took a lot of my time. It was taking time away from my family and time away from my wife, and I just kind of put that thing all back in a box and said, forget it, right? It's not that important that, that I should give that much time because this verse changed my life and my thinking about that, and I want to sort of lead that to you. In the book of Nehemiah, uh, it's a book about leadership, and it's a book about rebuilding, and, and Nehemiah leads the people of Israel on a, on a a huge rebuilding project. And it's interesting how that comes about because Nehemiah, and it's a story, by the way, it takes place in about 444 B.C. So if you had 2014 on to 444, you're, <laughs> it's a long time ago, okay? It's back before Christ came into this world in, in human form. And he's there, and he's in a place called Persia. And there's an emperor there, Artaxerxes I. You probably remember him from history class, right? Probably not. And Artaxerxes was the emperor of, you know, the 
the strongest empire in the world at that particular time. And Nehemiah worked for him. And he tells us right at the end of chapter 1 that he was the king's cupbearer. And what that means is that when the king went to take a drink, because there were rascals around those days that didn't like the king and they tried to put poison in the cup. So Nehemiah had the job of tasting the wine or whatever was in the cup before the king drank it. Now, you need to understand that his job was a lot more significant than that. If, if you're going to be the, the cupbearer of the king, generally you would have been a friend of the king. And you were an official in his court. It was a, a lot more significant than just that he took the cup and he tasted what he was drinking to keep him from, from getting poison. But that's just sort of the background to this particular story. And Nehemiah is there, and, and he's really a slave because a number of years before, the nation of Israel had been carried into captivity for 70 years of captivity under the Babylonians. And then they were in, the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians, and Nehemiah is one of those that continued on under the, the Persians in captivity. So he probably had never seen the land of Israel. He was probably born in captivity because he's been, Israel's been in captivity about 100 years. So the chances are he wasn't 100 plus years old. That's what you need to be thinking. But some people returned that had been to Israel and they come back and he asks them in chapter 1 about the condition of the city. And he, he just says, uh, he says, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped that had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. That's verse 2. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And Nehemiah hears of the distress and destruction of the city and the awful condition that his people are in. And it breaks his heart. And you're going to find out that he, he says here as a result of that, verse 4, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. And I was fasting. If you don't know what that means, it means going without food. All right? Because you're so burdened and concerned, you don't even bother to eat. You're just praying and crying out to God. And he says, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And he prays this prayer and says, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep uh, your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your, your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which they have sinned, and kind of goes on in that way. He's, he's just crying out to God, and he's confessing their sins because he knows the reason they're in captivity is because they've gotten into idolatry, and they've forsaken God and rebelled against the Lord and worshiped the God of heaven or, or the queen of heaven and, and a lot of other bad things that they had done that ended them up in captivity. So he's praying and crying for God to hear. And there's a background to that, that that I don't have time to get into for you this evening. My wife warned me just before I get up here, said, you have no reason to go over time tonight. All right, so she's already put that bug in my ear. Nehemiah teaches us some wonderful lessons. And one of the lessons he teaches us here is that godly leaders pray. And I want to lay a challenge before you tonight. This might be the one thing that you need to work on. You may need to work on your prayer life. Some of you may need to say, you know, this is going to be the year where I decide I'm going to start coming to prayer meeting and join together with the people of God on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. You got that, right? And, and I'm going to be together here, and we're going to pray, and we're going to lay hold of God, and we'll confess our sins, and we'll pray for needs in people's lives, and we'll pray for the power of God to come down and bless Devon Park and bless the city of Fredericton and bring people to Christ and change people's lives. We need some people that will do that this year. I'll guarantee you if it's not this year, there will be a year where God will come along and he'll say that's the thing that you need to work on, that you need to begin to build in your life is your prayer life. This would be a great year to get involved in that. We need some people praying. We need some of our younger people praying. If that doesn't change, there won't be a prayer meeting in Devon Park before very long. 
because us guys are getting older. We need a new generation to step up and say, you know what, we believe in God. We believe that God's taught us that we ought to call upon him. And there's something special about God's people coming together and praying and calling upon the name of the Lord. And I, I just want you to consider that. But that's the thing that Nehemiah shows the leadership here. And he begins to, to cry out before the Lord. And you know the great thing is that God's so great and he's so awesome and so sovereign but you can get his attention anytime you want. I don't know if you've thought about that, but that's significant, isn't it? That he will hear me. Call unto me and I will answer thee. Right? Jeremiah 33. Call. I'll answer. I'll do some things that you wouldn't believe. If you just call. Don't you want to see God do some things in Devon Park this year? That people won't say, oh, pastor did that, the deacons did that, this person did that. They'll say, God did that. That people out there looking at us will say, you know what? Lives are being changed at Devon Park Baptist Church. People are being saved. Christians are getting right with God. We call that revival. I don't care what you call it. I just want to see it happen. And I'll guarantee you this, we won't see it if we don't pray. If we don't get it, that we've got to get together to pray as God's people. And Nehemiah's prayer is centered around building a wall. Sounds kind of insignificant. Doesn't even sound spiritual, does it? Build a wall. But what you've got to understand, a wall in those days was probably more important than having an army. Because if you had an army and it didn't have a wall that it could defend, they could be run over very, very easily. If you didn't have a wall, there were marauders and enemies, countries and, and, and terrorists and, that were around that they'd just ride in any time they wanted and take what they wanted and then take off. And that was happening to the children, children of Israel in Jerusalem because they had no wall and so they're in great distress because of that. And Nehemiah begins to pray about building this wall. And some of you need to begin to pray about some walls that you need to build in your life this year. Walls to, to, to separate and, and to keep certain things out of your life so that you're going to say, you know what, I'm not going to let my mind go there. I'm not going to let my eyes go here. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And, and I don't mean this all has to be negative, but let's face it, there's some negative things that we need to do to make an impact and a positive relationship with Jesus Christ. So Nehemiah prays. And he prays, he gets concerned that these walls are down and the enemy is coming in and, and they're at the mercy of the marauders that, that overrun them. Proverbs 25, 28 says, Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks control. Think about that for a moment. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks control. What's it saying? Well, the enemy can come in any time it wants, and what it's saying is that a man who leaves himself open any passing temptation Right? can come in there and be a marauder and steal his heart and his affections and, and lead him astray. So we need to build some walls in our lives. It might be a, a wall of getting our hearts and minds into the Scriptures, reading the Word of God and memorizing that Word and hiding it in our heart. How many of you in the last month have memorized one verse of Scripture? That's not many hands. Thankful there are some, but that's not many. Let me say this. It's not what? It's not enough. Does God tell us we ought to hide his word in our heart? That we hide it in there, that we might not sin against him, right? Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's God's word. That might be a good one to start with. Memorize that. And then begin to add to it the Word of God to, to build walls of protection around your life in different areas. There may be areas of weakness 
in your life where the walls have been torn down and you need to build those walls up in those areas. So think about this in terms of walls in your life that, that, that build some, some separation, but not necessarily walls where you cut yourself off from the world, but walls that will keep you from being overrun by the world, by the culture in which you live and its destructive habits. We don't need to pray today for God to build a physical wall around the city of Fredericton or even around Devon Park Baptist Church. But maybe we need to pray walls that God will make the people of God distinct. That the desires of our heart won't be, be so much like the world that nobody can tell if there's any difference between us and them. But in the, in the Bible, it says that we ought to make a distinction between that which is holy and that which is unholy. We've got a church today that doesn't understand that. It's not trying to do that. That there ought to be a difference determined between that which is clean and that which is unclean. Have you done that in your life? Have you defined some areas that, you know, I'm not going to go there because that would defile me. That's unclean. I'm not going there. I'm not going to visit certain sites on the Internet. I'm not going to listen to certain kinds of music. I'm not going to do that because I want to build a wall so that my life and my heart becomes pure before God. I want to grow in the Lord. Some of you, it's a wall of prayer you need to work on. Some of you, it's a wall in, in, of getting into the Word. Some of you, it's a wall of fellowship, of, of getting the people of God around you, getting into a small group or a Bible study or something like that where you've got a group of people that help you focus and stay on the wall, building the wall, so that at the end of this year, your life will have seen some significant difference in relation to God. I just want to challenge you in some of these things again tonight. I know there have been times in my life where I built a wall and, and then I spent a year tearing down that wall. Anybody ever done that? You know, you had good intentions, you, you made some changes, and then you got careless, you thought you'd arrived, and all of a sudden that wall has been torn down. And you got to go back and rebuild the wall again. Some of you may be there this year. That may be the thing that God says, I want you to work on in your life. The tragedy of Israel not having the wall around Jerusalem is that they no longer had any sense that, of the presence of God. They had lost the sense that, that there's a God with us and we need to live for him and we need to be worshiping him. They, they lost all of that without this wall. And Nehemiah comes to this conclusion. After prayer and weeping and fasting and mourning, that if there's one thing I need to do before this year is out, I need to go back to Jerusalem and I need to lead the people in building a wall. Some area, he says that if, of all the things that I could do with my year, that's, that's a thing that God laid on my heart. There, there are other things, but that's the most important thing. And if I don't get other things done, that's okay, but this is the thing I can't afford not to do in my life. I need to get back there. I need to build this wall. And God leads this man to come before the people and lay this compelling burden before the people. That begins to take, come together, if you will, in, in chapter 2. Because, you know, you can pray and you can get a burden and all those things, and you can know what the wall is, but then there comes a time where godly leaders got to act. He just got to do something, and, and, and you need to come to the place where you're prepared to act and do something, and for him, it meant going in before the king, <laughs> and that was kind of dangerous because if the king didn't like what you asked for, he could just say off with that guy's head, and coming before the king, and, and finally the day comes, and he's kind of sad, I guess the burden just got to him, and the king says, what's wrong with you? I've never seen you sad before my presence. What's going on? Tell me. And, it, and, and it's kind of interesting what it says. It says, so I prayed. Now, he didn't pray one of these 40-minute prayers. It was one of those arrow prayers. Just, God, give me wisdom here. I'm going to talk to the king. And he says to the king, what's bothering me is that my people are in distress. And what I'd like to do, I'd like to go back and build a wall. Do you think I could have some time off to do that? Now, let me remind you, he's a slave. 
Slaves usually didn't get to do those things in those days, but he says, could I have permission to take some time off and go back? And the king's question was this. It says the king with the queen sitting beside him. I don't know why it puts in that detail, but says, he says the king said, how long? I figure he asked that question because that's a woman question, right? They want to know how long. If a man says, I'm going to fix the bathroom, wife wants to know how long. You know, because guy's thinking six months, she's thinking six minutes. So he asked, how long? And, and just to show you how much Nehemiah has thought this thing through, he says, so I set him a time. He had thought it through so much that he'd figured out it'll take me about this much time to get the job done. He'd figured out the cost, what he's going to need. If you read through chapter 2, you'll find out that he says he got the, the timber, the lumber, all the things, the building supplies that he needed. And the king says, yes, you can do it. And he sends him back there and, and gives him permission to, to do this great thing for his God. And you think, wow, everything's going to be great from this point on. I'm going back, going to build a wall. But then when you get into chapter 4 of Nehemiah, there's some other things there. Let me just say in chapter, chapter 3, I think it is, of Nehemiah, is that, that he goes back there and, and, and he arranges the people. And it's kind of interesting how he does it. It says he, he puts people working on different parts of the wall. And many of them, it says this, they worked near the area where they lived. Now you think about it. You're living in Jerusalem and the marauders are coming in and you're near the wall it would be to your advantage to build the wall where what? Where you live, where you got this personal interest. You got an interest in having this wall go up. And so he, he strategically puts people to work in areas where they've got a, an interest. And, and so they begin to build here. I want my wall built, so I work on that. And Graham wants his wall built next door to me, and so he's building his. And Micah wants his built. He's next door to me, and he's building on his section of the wall, and it begins to go up. And think, wow, this is all wonderful. Let me just warn you, if you decide to build your wall, you need to understand that when you get to chapter 4 of Nehemiah, he faces a lot of opposition. And if you try to make a decision tonight that I'm going to make a resolve, you already know probably at this point in this message, this is the area I need to work on. This is the wall I need to build in my life this year. You need to know you're going to face some opposition to that. And it may come from the oddest places. You know, I, I've made decisions about different things in my life, and I've been shocked sometimes where the opposition comes from and the way that it comes at times. You know, so often, sadly, it comes from God's people. Not the world. You tell them, hey, I'm working on this. Good for you. Tell it to a Christian. You'll never do it. Hey, I'm working on losing weight. Yeah, I've heard. You tried that before. You'll never do it. Could we work? Some of you need to work this year on not discouraging people. <laughs> that might be a wall to be an encourager instead of a discourager in other people's lives. Just trying to build people up instead of tear them down and, and, and move them away from the, the decisions that they're making. What I'm trying to tell you, though, is that it's not easy. When you make a decision to do something for Christ, the enemies will be there. And Nehemiah faced the enemies. And if you uh, read in chapter 4, and I don't have time to read these passages, unfortunately, you're going to find out that there was a guy named Sanballat. Isn't that a great name? You, you're probably going to have a son and want to call him Sanballat. It might work better for your dog. I'm, I'm not sure. But, but they, begin, they begin by mocking and, and say things like, you know, look at that feeble wall they're building. If a fox goes up on that thing, it's going to crumble beneath them. Ha, ha, ha. But the work goes on because Nehemiah has made a determination, I'm going to build my wall. No matter what anybody says, anybody does, I'm going to build this wall that God's led me to build this year, and I'm staying on the wall. And then send ballot and then realize, you know, the wall is not so feeble, and this is not good for us because we can't go in and get what we want anymore quite as easily as we used to, so... They sent a message off to Nehemiah and said, why don't you come out to one of the villages like Ono and meet with us? We'd like to sit down and talk with you. You know, maybe we could help you with your project. We could give a few dollars. We could give some building supplies. We could do something here to help you guys, you know, and, and to, to build this wall. 
And you know they're not interested in helping build the wall. And if you read chapter 4, you'll say their intent was to bring harm to Nehemiah. They wanted to stop him. And the interesting thing, these guys are persistent. Four times they send the same message. Come on, you're not that busy. You've got to take a break. You've got to have lunch sometime. Come have lunch with us. And every time, Nehemiah comes back with the same answer. Look at it in chapter 6 here. He says, verse 3, So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. I am doing something great that God has put upon my heart and I'm not coming down. This last year, many of you don't even know it, but it's been a very difficult year. And there have been things that have happened where we've been so hurt and shed so many tears that I'll be honest, there's been moments where I thought, you know, maybe it's time for me to just walk away. I've even thought that maybe it's time just to get out of the ministry. And God used this verse again. My life. Stay on the wall. God called you to Devon Park. Stay at Devon Park until God calls you someplace else or home to glory. Right? Stay on the wall. Some of you are going to need this verse this year. Stay on the wall. Even through the tears, even through the pain, through the opposition, through the discouragements, because if God's given you something to do and laid it upon your heart, it's worth finishing. It's worth doing. It's worth staying on the wall and don't come down off the wall. And these guys came four times and said, come on, Nehemiah, come and have lunch with us. And then they didn't give up. They, they sent a fifth message. And this time, they're trying to attack Nehemiah's reputation. They said, we're going to we're going to send a letter to the king, and we're going to tell him, we've heard, we've heard there's a rumor going around about you that, that you're going to lead these people to rebel against the king of Persia, and, and you're trying to make yourself king, and there was no truth to it whatsoever, and Nehemiah sends back, you know what, guys? You just made that up in your own minds and your own hearts, and there's no truth to it, and I ain't coming off the wall. I'm staying on my ladder. I'm staying on the wall. We're going to build the wall. We're going to get it done. And they still didn't quit. You know what they did? They got a guy that Nehemiah thought was a friend, Shemaiah. And Shemaiah is hired by the enemies. And Nehemiah doesn't know this, but he says, Nehemiah, come on over here. We need to talk. He says, Nehemiah, you know what? You read it in the fourth chapter. There's a group of people. Right here in this city, not just out there, it's not just sitting down. There's some people in this city don't want you to build the wall. And they're talking, and they're saying they're going to come one of these nights, in the middle of the night, and they're going to take your life. And here's what you ought to do. You ought to get yourself a room over there in the temple where the doors are locked and they can't get to you. Now, folks, you think about this for a moment. Nehemiah comes down off the wall. He's hiding out in the temple for fear. What does that do to the courage of all the people that are building on the wall? Well, one, he's just looking out for himself. He's only worried about his own safety and all of this and so on. And praise God, Nehemiah says, you know what? I am not going to sin against God and come down off this wall. I'm going to stay on the wall. I'm not going to go hide out in the temple or any place else for that matter because, you know what? God's hand's on this. God's doing something here, and I'm going to stay on the wall. You know, we need some people that will make that kind of commitment as deacons and boards of directors and school board members and Sunday school teachers and Awana workers and so on, that I'm going to do, what am I going to do this year? I'm going to stay on the wall. <laughs> Discouragements will come. Some of the children's parents will gripe, and I want to what? I want to quit, but I won't quit. I'm going to stay on the wall. 
I'm going to keep building the wall of righteousness within Devon Park Baptist Church so that we can have an influence and an impact upon this city. We're going to do something great for God. I'll stay on the wall. I'm doing a great work. I can't what? Can't come down. I can't quit. I can't give up. I can't stop. There's a task that I need to complete. And I don't know what that task is for you again. It may be something that doesn't even seem to be spiritual that God lays on your heart. But do you ever stop to think about it that, that if Nehemiah had come down off of a wall, would the wall have ever been built? Not likely. I mean, God could have raised up somebody else, I guess, but think of the blessing he would have missed out on in his life because he came off the wall. Chances are if he'd come off the wall, they would have taken his life. It would have destroyed his life. He stayed on the wall. I want to tell you that there's some things about that wall in your life that if you don't stay on the wall and you don't build it, have the potential to destroy your life. You don't learn to build a wall of prayer and you don't do, learn to build a wall in the word of God and in fellowship with the people of God that nothing's going to drive me away. And yes, there's going to be some people that are failing in the church and discourage me and say nasty things, but you know what? I'm going to stay on the wall. I joined this church, made a covenant relationship with God towards this people of God, and you aren't going to drive me out of this people of God. We're going to stay on the wall. We're going to keep building. We're going to keep working no matter what for God. We're going to do something for the Lord. And if you don't do it, it'll destroy you. It might destroy your family. If Nehemiah had come down off the wall and Nehemiah had been killed, how many other families would have been put at risk? All the families in Jerusalem. The job never would have got completed. Generations would have been affected because of it, because of Nehemiah. And I don't know what potential things that you need to do and what your wall is, whether it's your finances. Listen, you don't get your finances in order this year. Some of you, it's going to hurt somebody else, isn't it? Has the potential. If you don't get them in order and you're not running them the way that God wants you to, to bring great harm. Some of you, it's it's... Maybe going to be a health challenge. It might be something like God just says, you know what? You need to lose a few pounds this year. You say, now, preacher, you've gone from preaching to meddling. Stay out of that. Just stick with spiritual things. Well, this is a spiritual thing. There's some verses in the Bible about gluttony, right? And being over wealth isn't good for your health. And, and, and I may not be in the best shape of the world, but listen, I work at it. I get on the exercise cycle and the, the, the bands, stretch bands and different stuff, and you'd be surprised how much muscle there is under all of this. <laughs> you know, the Bible says that physical exercise profits a little. And the way I look at it, if, if I want to preach for another 10 years, and I'd love to, I don't know if it'll be a Devon Park, but I'd like to think, you know, I don't think I'll be preaching at 113 like Bob, but, but I'd like to think I've got a few more years. And I might not be able to do that if I don't take care of my body. And that means that's a spiritual thing, doesn't it? Right? That might be just one of the things that God lays on your heart that you need to take care of, and it is scriptural, and, and it is something that we need to do, and, and so that... You know, we're not sick every Sunday morning. Oh, I don't feel good. I don't think I can go this morning. And before we know it, we're totally out of fellowship with God and his people. It could be something that simple. I don't know what God's going to lay in your heart. But I think there's something that you need to say out loud to yourself. Some of you need to understand this year that your wall, if you've got young kids like this, that may be your wall. And some of you need to go home tonight after your kids are in bed and they're asleep and walk into that room and just look at the kid laying there and say, you know what? I've been neglecting my children. I've been doing this and that and I'm not, I'm not building them up in the word of God and we're not having family devotions and we're not doing this and, and I'm letting them watch terrible things on TV and, and all these things and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to build a wall in my home, with my family, with my kids. My children are going to be my wall this year. By the way, for some of you, it's teenagers. 
It's going to take a little more work. You need to say, that's my wall. I'm going to build a relationship with my kids this year. It's not all going to be about fighting about this and you can't do that and, and all the things, but you're going to build an actual relationship, and, and that's a hard wall to build. But you're going to go out of your way to build that wall because that's the great work that God's put on your heart that you need to do above anything else you do this year. This will shock some of you, but some of you may have to drop out of something at the church in order to build that wall and give your time to your kids. I'm not saying it is. Don't use that as an excuse. But it might be something that God says, this is so important. Build this wall. For some of you, man, he's going to say, you know what? This is a year you better take seriously your relationship with your wife. You better begin to build some time into that life for your wife because it's not good. And if you look down the road a year from now and then five years from now, is that where you really want to be? Wouldn't you like, men, to have a better relationship with your wife at the end of 2015 than you have right now? That may be the thing that God's saying to you and pressing home to your heart that you need to work on and take seriously before the Lord. And some of you ladies, you need to give some thought to think about your husbands. And I don't know what you're thinking, but I know probably if you're like my wife, you're saying, he's a piece of work. <laughs> he's my wall. <laughs> I'm going to have to build. There's, there's some places that are broken down in this wall, and, and I need to build on that wall this year. Ladies, you're there because you're to be our helpmeets, aren't you? To help us be better than we could be on our own. Are you doing that? That could be the piece of the wall that you need to work on this year to strengthen in your life and for your family and in your relationships. If you're a college student, you probably already know what it is that you need to build a wall on this year. There's some areas that you need to, to build up because there's some breaches there and the enemy's beginning to creep in and cast some doubts and other things in your life and you need to build yourself a foundation on the, on, on the wall that's built on the Word of God. You need to get into this word, and you need to get into prayer. And some of you need, need to realize, you know what? Those are okay people, but it's not good for me. Those relationships are leading me in the wrong direction, away from the Lord. And, and for this next year, I'm going to cut off those kind of relationships because it's more important that I build this wall that God's laid upon my heart. You understand what I'm saying? If you don't, I have to go back and say it all over again. At least not. Don't lie, but... I know I've got to finish. By the way, you know the good news here? It says eventually they finished the wall. With all the opposition and everything else, in, in chapter 6 and verse uh, 15, it says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. 52 days. That was a significant thing to build this wall with all the opposition and everything else and put it up in that period of time. And by the way, can I say this? They did it all without one single miracle. We would like to see God just work miracles so we don't have to do anything. There were no miracles. They were just out there committing to work together to build a wall to the glory of God. And that's exactly what happened. If you read the 16th verse here, it says this, And it happened when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Wouldn't it be great at the end of 2015 to have some of those that are our enemies, and we've got them, who will be able to say, you know what? We better stop putting down and talking about Devon Park because God is doing something. God is saving people. God is changing lives. God is active. God has done something. Let me, let me ask you this. The enemies around yours, would they have said that if Nehemiah hadn't built the wall? If he hadn't stayed on the wall and focused on the wall and resolved, we're going to get this done and I'm doing a great work. I don't have time to come down. I'm just going to do this for God. I really, really believe this message is important. 
And do I wish that this place was filled with all of our people tonight? Yep, but they're not. So who is it that God's going to work through? He's not probably going to work through those that aren't hearing this. Who's he going to have to work through? Me and you. You. To build these walls, to change the way things are. Now, I'll hear from this from my wife afterwards. But Nehemiah led the people, if you go on in this book, he led them to spend some time in the Word. By the way, it says that they read in the Word for a quarter of the day and then they spent the next quarter of the day confessing their sin and worshiping God. Every time we hear the Word, it ought to produce something in our lives and it ought to result in an action. Did you know that? It ought to do something within us. And one of the actions, at least, is that we ought to confess. Anybody here got some sin they could confess? Nobody wants to stand up and do it, but you know you got some. And, and then when we confess it and we know he's forgiven us, what ought we to do? We ought to just worship him because he's a great and glorious God. And, and, and God's doing some great and wonderful things. And, and Nehemiah leads his people to get into the word. He leads his people to confess their sin in chapter 9. It's a great prayer. If you're ever uh, in need of a prayer where you want to confess your sin, read Nehemiah chapter 9 and Ezra chapter 9, just two great chapters in relation to that. And really, he summarizes their whole history. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 33 summarizes it this way, God, you've been faithful, and we haven't. And, and I thought about that. Isn't it sad that the whole history of the nation of Israel from beginning to this day that Nehemiah is talking about can be summarized in that statement. You've been faithful and we have not. I don't know if that's true of Devon Park. I suspect that in some areas it would be true to say, God, you've been faithful and we what? We have not. Let's end 2015 with at least one area in every one of our lives where we can say, God, you've been faithful, and we've been faithful in building the wall. We've been faithful in letting you move into this area of our lives, whatever it is, whatever is laying on your heart, and letting God change that thing in your life so that you're going to be a different person. Some of you need to start tonight by some time in confessing your sin. I like what a, an old Puritan said. He said, it's better to die in prison it's better to die in a ditch than to die in your sin. That is so true. That's so true. And it's hard to move on and press towards the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus until we come to the place where we we're willing to admit there's some areas where we're messing up. There's some areas where our wall is being torn down and we're letting the enemy come in and then begin the process of rebuilding the wall that area of weakness in our lives where we've surrendered to the enemy. Do we just need God to begin to work powerfully in our lives? And then here's the thing I've got to finish with. Chapter 10, he leads the people in making a covenant with God. First begins with the governors, political leaders, the priests, the, the leaders of the people in verse 14. And then in verse 28 of chapter 10, 10, 10 it says, now, the rest of the people, all the people had to get involved in this. And, and as you read down through there, i got to skip some stuff. It says, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding, these joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. It says in verse 30, that uh, we would not give our daughters as wives to the peoples of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. We're not going to marry as Christians, unsaved people, and so on, if you want to put it in today's context. And I don't want to make this all about a bunch of rules and, and, and legalism and all of that, but you know what? Some of you need to build a wall of some standards in your life. That we won't do this, and we will do this for God and, and we will not take the name of the Lord our God in vain. And, and, and a lot of the Ten Commandments could fit in there, but other things in our lives that God could use. And the significant thing is that this was put in writing. And they had to sign their names to it. And what I want to challenge you to do 
is to take a sheet of paper. If you got one in your Bible, do it tonight before you walk out of here. And you write down the thing that God's been surely putting on your mind tonight. You're part of the wall that you're going to work on. That you're saying, this will be different. I will get on my knees in prayer. I'll memorize whatever scripture I have to. I'll talk with the pastor if I have to. I'll get a group of friends around me that are godly if I have to. I'll take whatever is necessary, but I'm going to stay on that wall and I'm going to build it to the glory of God. Write that thing down. Sign it. If you got the courage, take another slip of paper. And whether you put your name on that paper or not is insignificant. But I'd like you over the next week or two, tonight if you wish, give that to me. And I want to take those things and begin to pray about it. If Micah puts on his slip of paper, I, I want to work on my prayer life this year. I want to pray for Micah about that, specifically. Take that to the Lord in prayer. If you don't want to put your name on it, that's okay. All right? You just say, this is too personal and, and embarrassing. You just write whatever it is on that slip of paper, and this is the wall that I'm working on this year. With God's help, to God's glory, at the end of 2015, it's going to be some things that are different in this life. It's going to be a life. When the enemies look at this life, the enemies of God, they're going to say, God is at work in Mary's life, Terry's life, Joanna's life, Kevin's life, Ron's life, your life. Right? Because there's no sense in me preaching this message and throwing out this big broad net without making it very, very personal for you, and that's what I'm trying to do. If you don't Get so specific that you can put it on a piece of paper. Your life will not change this year in that area. If you can't even define what it is for yourself, you're not going to change it. So write it down. Let God change your life. And I don't know if you had a closing hymn or not, Evie, but we'll, I'm just going to stop. And I think we should bow just in a few moments of prayer. Let's... Let's do silent prayer for just a minute or two. And then I'm going to ask Brother Bob Dunlop if he would just close in a word of prayer, leading us to the throne of grace.